Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the Boston Public Library's local history lecture series. Tonight we are very pleased to have Meg Muckenhaupt here to talk about her book, The Truth About Baked Beans, An Edible History of New England. Meg writes about ecology, travel, history, and food. Her work has been featured in the Boston Globe, the Boston Phoenix, Boston Magazine, and the Time Out Boston Guide. She is the author of Boston Garden and Green Spaces and Cabbage, a Global History, and lives in Lexington, Mass. Questions will be answered during or after the event, either live or from the chat box. Please note that this program is being recorded. Thanks for being with us and enjoy the talk. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Diane, wave if you can see me. <laughs> oh yeah. Hi there, okay, great. Hi, I'm Meg Muckenhout. Welcome to my show. Uh, they're gonna talk about the truth about baked beans available at your local public library branch near you, as is Cabbage, a global history, another unlikely topic for lengthy writing, but I wrote it anyway. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about New England food history and shortly I'm gonna switch over to the slide view. And again, I will be looking at the chat periodically after every slide. I'm gonna to try to answer your questions as they go along. I may not get to all of them and there will be time after the talk for more questions. It'll take about 45 minutes, but um, let's, talk a little bit about what's going to be in this talk. So I'm going to be talking about two main questions, which is basically, how did we get to the idea of New England food we have right now? And how did we come to have baked beans? But first I'm going to switch over to the slides and share my screen and share a couple of disclaimers. Okay. There we go. Um, so first of all, I am going to switch to the next slide. There we go. Okay, disclaimers. I know a lot of you have grown up in New England. Some of you may have grown up eating Indian pudding, baked buds, baked beans, and clam cakes every Saturday night, um, and have a real sense of New England traditions. And I respect that. But part of the point of this talk and the point of this book is that that isn't everyone's tradition. It's a tradition that rose at a particular time for some particular reasons, which may not be the reasons we want to think about New England food in a particular way right now. Um, I grew up in New Jersey for part of my life. I've been living in New England for a long time. I respect your tradition, but I wanna talk about how there may be other traditions in New England food besides the one that has come down to us. And as part of that, let me just defend my credentials for a moment. This is a picture of <clears throat> the good ship lion. Actually, it's a picture of another ship because I couldn't find a picture of the ship lion. My family arrived in New England in 1632 in the body of one Bartholomew Heath, who was 17 years old at the time. Um, I have ancestors who fought in the American Revolution. I have ancestors who were made to swear a loyalty oath after Shays Rebellion. How embarrassing. The reason I'm telling you this is that I'm one of these people who has New England roots that go back a really long time, but in my youth, I wasn't here. I came back at the age of 16 to New England from New Jersey. So I have a little bit of an insider's view, but a little bit of an outsider's view, which led me to some questions about what is New England food all about? So I began thinking about this book with the question, who thought of putting molasses into a pot of baked beans? You know, when I think of main dishes in the United States. And I tried to think of the ones that have the sheer amount of sugar in them that baked beans have. It's hard to come up with another really good example. Barbecue gets close, you know, it, but it still doesn't seem to have quite as much sugar in it as a dessert. So when I moved to England and started hearing about Bean Town and Boston baked beans, it confused me. Um, Various friends of mine who are outside the region have found them and they talk about Boston baked beans. Their friends think, oh, you mean that candy that's that sugar stuff around peanuts. They don't even think of Boston baked beans as being a real food. It's supposed to be a candy. Why is this? Why did we get 
molasses in a main dish like this when other regions that have molasses don't do it. And how did this come to be one of the parts of the official list of what New England food is supposed to be? I mean, when you look around, when you go out to a restaurant, you don't really find a lot of Boston baked beans out there. You find barbecue beans, you find beans frijoles and things like that uh, as a side dish in a lot of uh, Latin restaurants. But, you know, you don't find them very much. You don't find them in big vats at the supermarket, at the soup station next to the salad bar, back when I used to have soup stations and salad bars. You know, they're supposed to be part of our culture, but at the same time, there's something that's disappeared. Something that's sort of there, but marked by its absence. Maybe because a lot of people just don't like them. You know, and to start, I'm going to take us back away from screen share for a moment because I want to show you something. I, I went through my kitchen today and thought about what New England, what, what United States national products do I have sitting in my kitchen? So hang on and I'll show you what I found. Okay, hi. So went through my pantry, picked out some stuff, looked for what says America to me? What do I have that I eat that's American? Well, one of the things I have is that all American product, salsa, very popular. You go through a supermarket, you see an aisle of Mexican food and salsa and peach salsa and mango salsa and Hawaiian salsa and Tex-Mex salsa. Salsa, pretty popular. Lots of New Englanders eat it, not from New England. Pecans from Georgia. Yay, pecans are wonderful. Do we have a local nut? Do we know any nuts that grow in New England? Not so much. Um, if you want to think about Southern foods that actually have chain restaurants named after them, there's Kentucky Fried Chicken, there's all sorts of food from New Orleans, jambalaya, people talk about Southern cornbread. There's a lot of really popular Southern food all over the United States. Oh, here's something local, Teddy Peanuts. Fine thing, Everett's finest products. I love their peanut butter. Oh, peanuts don't grow here. Peanuts are from Georgia. Hmm. I guess that isn't a New England food either. What else do we have here? Oh, we have sorghum molasses because my husband grew up in Virginia. We make maple syrup in New England. That's a good New England thing, although most of it actually comes from Quebec nowadays and probably will in the future since the climate is getting warmer and it's getting harder to tap trees in southern New England because getting the right temperature exactly the right time, it's getting a little bit iffy down here. Okay, what else do we have? Oh, we have cranberries, except these cranberries were grown in Wisconsin, like most cranberries. Okay, what else do we have from New England here? Uh, American, we have salmon from Alaska. Bob's Red Mill, there's lots of that. That's really American looking. Look at that old timey language. Look at that wonderful font. Bob's Red Mill is in Oregon. Oh, but else here, oh, finally, Bar Harbor clam juice. Yay! New England has clams. And New England clam chowder is known around the United States. You know, you can find a legal seafood at Logan Airport representing clam chowder and food. But my point is that when you think about New England foods, when you think about what defines New England as a food, you find stuff that you really can't find in other states. It hasn't exported well. Um, I see somebody talked about Fig Newtons. Does anybody actually remember that they're from Newton? You know, in theory, we can claim that the Toll House chocolate chip cookie, although there are other claims on that too. That is now an American cookie, even though it started probably at the Toll House restaurant in, in Wakefield, but it's not identified as a, as a New England thing because everybody likes chocolate chip cookies. It's been claimed as American. We'll talk about fluff later, Mary Mangan. I see you. Anyway, so I go on to share my next slide here. I'm gonna share with you a little list of 10 truly New England foods, which is pretty typical of what you're going to find if you look online, if you look on what used to be in flight magazines, if you look at all sorts of tourist bureaus. So here we go, sharing that screen again. Share away. All right, so let's take a look at this list. Oh, look at these New England foods. Okay, lobster roll. Sure, you can get that at McDonald's in the summer around here. You can buy lobsters for like six bucks a pound at Market Basket, fine food. Fried clams, sure. I ate them at Howard Johnson's when I was growing up in New Jersey, but I'll, I'll give us that. Clams seems to be a thing around here. Indian pudding. When was the last time you had Indian pudding? Do you like Indian pudding? 
does anyone you know like Indian pudding? Have they make Indian? Do you know it's in Indian pudding? Why does it start with the name Indian as well? It's not from the subcontinent colonized by the British in the 19th century. Um, what does that mean? Clam cakes and chowder. Johnny cakes. Do you know how to make a Johnny cake? Have you had a Johnny cake? I know there are places around here that serve Johnny cakes, but there's a lot of dispute over what they are. Boston baked beans and boiled dinner. Oh boy, everybody's favorite, old pot roast. Um, the point here is that when you look at this list, some of these things are popular, but some of them really aren't. And they're not in supermarkets and they're not in restaurants and they're not in the Boston Globe's food section or the Herald's food section if they have one. They're sort of this list of foods, but they don't seem to be the things that people actually want to eat. In other parts of the United States, the foods of the region are things that people eat all the time. You know, in Missouri, you've got the St. Louis gooey butter cake, you've got barbecue, you've got chili, you've got Cincinnati five-way chili, you've got Tex-Mex, you've got New York style pizza, you've got bagels. You've got this stuff that everyday people appreciate, they have opinions about, they seek out the good things, the best parts of it. You talk to anybody from New York and New Jersey who lives in New England about pizza, you're gonna get an earful. If you go outside of, take a New England out of New England, and ask them about baked beans, are you gonna get an opinion? Maybe not. And this seemed very strange because I see the same list of roughly the same items over and over and over again represented as New England food. So the question comes to my mind, how did this list come up? How did we come to an idea of what New England is? And I'll show you just one little brief clip showing what some other people think of New England food. Come on, next slide. There we go, here it comes. What is everyone? Who knows? Maybe they finally figured out clam chowder is disgusting because it's basically a savory latte with bugs in it. So, as you can see, the um, here's another opinion about New England cuisine from the Boston Globe. Why don't New Englanders like New England cuisine? Well, that's the question. That's why I started looking at this book. Why I started researching where baked beans came from because that struck me as being an example of a food that everybody talks about, but, and some people like, but not a lot of people. It's not like pizza, New York style pizza. It's not like a mission burrito in San Francisco. It's not something that people say, oh yeah, oh God, I'd really miss that. It's not, the soul of people. It's not something that's really even very popular. And yet it still comes up as being our identity, as being our food. So let's talk about, ah, things are wrong. Okay. Oh, be a nice computer. I like you. The case of Boston baked beans. Dun, dun, dun. So here's just one example of the lack of interest in Boston baked beans. You look at all recipes, a very popular Food channel on YouTube, and they have 1.5 million subscribers, and only about 5% of them were interested in how to make Boston baked beans. I mean, yeah, they're great, but again, this isn't the sort of food that you think is being the everyday food of the common man at this point, if people just don't want to bother making it. So I decided to look back at the history of baked beans, and this is the story that I found over and over again roughly this. It's based on a book that was published around the time of the bicentennial when a lot of stories about food and national foods came up. You know, you got lots of books published listing 50 recipes from 50 states and they had to have some from Massachusetts and they either chose clam chowder or baked beans. And here's the story about baked beans. The, Indian, the Indians pit cooked their beans in maple sugar and included a lump of bear fat. The New Englanders replaced the maple sugar with molasses, the bear fat with salt pork, and retain the principle of slow cooking. So this story has a lot of problems. There's one part in this which is true. The rest of it is pretty much false. And let me just start with this question of who are All the- All right. Uh, somebody needs to be muted. Thank you. Right, so you shouldn't be able to talk right now, whoever you're talking. Thanks, Diane. Um, Oh, okay. Hi. Okay. Are we, are we good? We're good. No, sorry. It's all right. You know, this is Zoom. This, you have to have at least one muting, unmuting incident every time. And this is ours. 
So who are these Indians? The people who were living here at the time the pilgrims arrived had names. There were lots of different people. There are the Patuxet, the Narragansett, the Massachusetts, the Wapanag. Um, they had different traditions. They had different opinions about things. They sided with different people, the British or the Dutch or whoever else was around, depending on what their political objectives were. Anytime you see something that refers to the Indians, that's a big wee wee warning sign. Somebody's making something up or somebody didn't bother doing their research or they didn't think that the people involved were important enough to mention, which those are all problems. Um, and this little story is repeated in Wikipedia, um, a story of history book by Manley Williams called The Story Behind the Dish. It's something that's out there. So the beans are alive. Um, years ago, I had the good pleasure, fortune to talk with a wonderful food historian named Sandra Oliver briefly about baked beans. And she had a theory about how they became sweet, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But the main thing she taught me was the word fake lore, which is when people make up stories that seem like they should be true, but are actually fake. And I'm going to show you how the story about how baked beans came together is probably fake and how that feeds into our idea of what New England food and just how much we're up against when we're trying to think about what people actually eat and what actually should represent who we are in New England. Okay, so like I said before, one detail in this little paragraph about baked beans is true. But let's go through and talk about all the different ingredients they've mentioned. The first one that comes up is maple sugar. And yes, I put the word in in there twice. I'm sure some of you have noticed that by now. Let's talk about maple sugar. Okay, here's a pretty picture of where maple sugar comes from. Maple sugar comes from maple trees. This is a picture of Vermont where there are lots and lots of maple trees nowadays, which is lovely. Uh, one of the reasons that there are lots of maple trees is right now is because most of the existing forests got chopped down in the 19th century, which wasn't all maple trees. The maple trees are one of the first things that come and recover after you, you chop forests down. You know, it's a little bit too early to get towering pines. And of course the chestnuts all disappeared because of the chestnut blight around 1900. Anyway, Vermont had a more diverse forest before it got taken down and we'll have it again. Lots of maple syrup made in Vermont, in Northern New Hampshire, in Quebec. Uh, was there much maple syrup being made in Massachusetts at the time of first contact between English settlers and the local Wapanogs, um, Massachusetts and other peoples? Probably not. Uh, you don't get a lot of maple trees growing near Plymouth because it's sandy and low soil. They like it a little bit colder, a little bit higher in elevation. Um, there's also evidence that there wasn't a heck of a lot of maple syrup going around uh, Massachusetts at the time because in 1635, Roger Williams wrote to John Winthrop talking about how Canonicus, uh, chief of the Narragansett would really love to get a gift of eight pounds of sugar, um, a punnet. If these people had ready access to sugar so much that they were regularly using it to boil up their beans, it seems like giving them a box full of sugar wouldn't have been such a big deal, but apparently it was. Um, you know, there, weren't, there were very few sources of sweetening when the Europeans first arrived in Massachusetts. There weren't any honeybees here until after 1630. Um, and I just want you to pause and think about our, uh, the people who came before us and what it was like to go on a wooden ship across an ocean that took weeks through storms and gales and waves, knowing that there was somewhere in the hold a hive of angry unfed bees just waiting to get out. Um, there wasn't much sugar cane up here. There wasn't much trade with Barbados and the other colonies that came to be the sugar colonies when the pilgrims first got here. Uh, they were busy having wars. Um, there was maple syrup probably being made in Canada. There's some records of Micmac and Abenaki having this stuff around, but there, there isn't much information. There isn't much record of it being in Massachusetts when people were supposedly sharing it around and making beans out of it. Um, it just doesn't seem to have been there. And sugar was a really big deal. You know, this is why we had slavery in this hemisphere, was to create sweet stuff. You'd think that if maple sugar was around, it would come up in the record in Southern New England. And it just, it just doesn't. And it doesn't for beans. And uh, just to illustrate a little bit of the story of Vermont for you, since it is part of New England, I just have another couple of pictures for you. Okay. 
Um, when I mentioned that the reason Vermont has so much of a forest is that the previous forest got shut down, this is one of the reasons why. This is a merino sheep. This one actually came after the major merino issues. Um, the merino craze of Vermont was roughly between 1810 and 1850. People wanted more sheep. Sheep were money. What do sheep eat? They don't eat trees, they eat grass. Fewer trees you have, the more grass you can grow. So who needs all those forests on your hillside anyway? And just in case you think that this particular picture of a sheep is an exaggeration in terms of its gracious form, I just want to show you a more contemporary picture of a sheep. This one is a drawing from about 1906, a descendant of the great sheep of Vermont. Here's a picture from about 1930 for the Museum of English Rural Life. Uh, they called it an absolute unit, and this was one of the most popular pictures of 2018 on Twitter. So just take a look at that. Solid sheep, one America's name for. Okay, um, another reason that Vermont is able to grow so many maple trees nowadays, by the way, just to spend one more moment on that, is they also did a lot of logging. This is what Sharon, Vermont, along the White River looked like in 1910 with a log drive. I don't know how much you can see of the shaved off hillsides there, but um, they took down a lot of trees. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons people started talking about New England's rural past and what it was used to be during the 19th century is the sheer number of changes that had happened in Massachusetts and Vermont and New Hampshire in terms of what the, what the landscape actually looked like. Um, between 1800 and 1850, Massachusetts forest cover went from 50% to 25%. And just to give you an idea of what that would have looked like, right now, Massachusetts is about 62% forest cover. So imagine half the trees in Massachusetts just gone, just, just chopped down. Uh, you know, they chopped them down for wood, they chopped them down to make new fields so they could grow more stuff to feed the cities. Um, it looked really different over the course of just a generation. Um, in Vermont, between 1800 and 1900, they went down to about 20% forest cover as well. Um, these places that people had grown up in, the people who were writing and thinking about recipes and cooking in the late 19th century and talking about New England food, had these memories, had these experiences of seeing the very landscape they expected from their childhood just physically transformed, uh, just devastated by, you could call it the ravages of capitalism. You could call it the efforts of people who live in rural communities to make a living and to get on with their lives. And this, keep this in mind, because this will come up again in a couple of slides when we talk about baked beans again. But Vermont, it's not what it used to be. It's actually a lot greener than it used to be at this point. All right, next slide. Okay, that's Canonicus. So maple syrup probably wasn't added to the first baked beans. Um, it wasn't around very much. It was something that exists in Northern areas, not Massachusetts. What about the salt pork? What about molasses? So I'm going to talk about molasses and one that might have come in baked beans in just a moment. And I need to give you one more warning before we proceed, which is warning, warning, warning. I'm going to talk a little bit about cookbooks. I have to give you this warning because although I'm going to cite cookbooks, um, you shouldn't entirely trust what I have to say because cookbooks are not a record of what people eat. Um, I find this happening a lot when I look at little little articles written by people about food in New England and what ye oldie people ate. They like to look at 19th century cookbooks. And cookbooks are not cooking. They are written for an audience and published for an audience, particularly the published ones. They're made for people who can read. They're made for people who can afford to buy books. They're made for people who want to cook something they don't already know how to make. They're made for people who did not learn to cook certain items from their mothers or their aunts or their grandmothers or their sisters or from somebody else in their community. So you're talking about people who are either disconnected from their family, from their heritage, or people who want to have depart from their family or their heritage. So who are these people? Um, in many cases, they're women who didn't have to work when they were growing up who didn't work in kitchens. These are women who aspire to seem more sophisticated than their family, make newfangled middle-class things. Um, cookbooks are an indicator of where people want to be to a certain extent. At least the cookbooks I'm looking at published in New England after 1850. You know, they, they, they reflect what people wish they were cooking. <laughs> 
not quite in the same way that contemporary like Martha Stewart and Food Network stuff does, but it's something of the same idea. So I looked at recipes from 274 cookbooks written between about 1850 and 2018 and asked myself, okay, how much molasses is in here compared to beans? When did the stuff get sweet? When did people start thinking of sweetening beans? I found recipes dating back to a newspaper article in 1829 suggesting, oh, if you want to have a special treat, put a tablespoon of molasses in your beans and we'll give them a lovely color. When they were cooking beans, you know, this isn't just a cup of beans on the stovetop. We're talking about a quart of beans at a time to feed an entire family, to feed everybody working on your farm or at your printing press, whatever you're running. A tablespoon of beans isn't a heck of a lot. Recipes nowadays usually ask for more like a half a cup or a cup to just a pint of beans, you know, a much, much higher proportion. When did that happen? Well, here's what I found. Basically, before about 1900, you've got the molasses starting to go up, starting to go up, goes up a little bit more, and then we have World War I and people are rationing sugar and they don't have so much. Stays about the same in the roaring 20s, and then I skip ahead to 2000, and we've got a heck of a lot of sugar. So, you know, basically a third of contemporary baked bean recipes is molasses or brown sugar or plain old sugar or some combination of it. It's just an astonishing amount of sugar. But it's not something I was finding when I was looking at articles at cookbooks and things like that before 1880. Um, one reason the molasses started to get more popular after an 1880 or so is because it, it seems old fashioned. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. I talk about the old um, New England kitchens, but it's something that doesn't seem modern. You know, white sugar, things that were refined, or the process of refining processes, molasses. Oh, that's, that's old timey. That's something they used to have in the 19th century as part of the Massachusetts community. It's brown, it's sticky, it has an undertaste. It's something you associate with grandmas. And it's something that people in the 1890s were associating with grandmas too. And the question is, why is something designated a desirable or good food that's associated with grandma? And we'll get to that in just a moment. Oh, one thing that is true about that little story about how baked beans were made is the bear fat. Everybody cooked with bear fat. Everybody likes fat bears. This particular bear is 435 Holly. It was the winner of the 2019 Fat Bear Week at Katmai National Park in Alaska. If you like fat bears, I strongly recommend you look at Katmai National Park social media. They have lots of fat bears there. Um, they don't eat molasses. They get fat by eating lots and lots of salmon that come up a salmon stream and they commonly reach over a thousand pounds. So, let that be a lesson to you. Even if they're full of omega-3s, you don't want to eat 200 pounds of salmon a week. It's just not good for you as a human. Okay, next slide. Okay. Why did people want to eat the stuff that seemed old fashioned? This is a New England kitchen of the olden time. If you look at popular magazines, things like, and books and, you know, little primers published for children at school after the American centennial, after 1876, you find dozens and dozens of pictures of something like this. Look, there's the warm hearth with the old fashioned cooking materials on top of it, the, the hanging kettle. You have corn hanging to dry. You have herbs hanging to dry. You have old grandma and her spinning wheel and her butter churn, you know, all sorts of useful industry. It's all very clean. There's very little decoration, um, looking like they are pure and honest and good people. The New England kitchen was very popular trope. This is the sort of thing that people would set up reproductions at fairs, at church fairs to raise money. I found actually a, a church manual from 1880 in Ohio talking about how they'd set up the New England kitchen as a fundraiser with great success and serving all those old time beans and pies. Um, the first ones I could find of New England kitchen exhibits happened during the Civil War uh, in Brooklyn to raise money for the Union Army and for Union nursing efforts, efforts and things like that. Um, these New England kitchen exhibits typically served food. Of course, they served food that was easy to make for large numbers of people and could be served up quickly. So yes, they served a lot of things that could be scooped out of a pot, like baked beans, like various sorts of mush, um, 
donuts too, things that you can handle easily and, and clear off easily. Sort of a fast food version of what people were eating in New England. Um, and a lot of people got their ideas of what New England was from these exhibits, which were purposely made to harken back to an earlier time. An earlier time, I will note, when New England was actually important in the United States. Remember, by late 19th century, New England's importance as, you know, a capital of the country had kind of been eclipsed by a lot of other places. You know, all the big economic opportunities were further west, uh, Cincinnati and beyond. Um, the major shipping in the United States was going in and out of ports like New York, not from New England. We were in some ways all kind of a backwater. Um, the, it wasn't completely full of Yankee stock. New England had never been full of Yankee stock, but when he, but, I'm not sure how much to go into this. There was a lot of fear and loathing of immigrants and immigration in New England in the 19th century. Um, in 1854, the entire Massachusetts legislature was taken over by, well, not taken over by, elected from members of the Know Nothing Party, whose major tenet was opposing any and all immigration. Um, there were plenty of immigrants in New England. There was a lot of anxiety about immigrants, a lot of desire to look back to when things were pure and wholesome, which means basically <laughs> partly when there were no immigrants around. So New England Kitchen, it served that, showed that New England was a model for the rest of the nation in terms of its pure, honest living. It emphasized that New England was full of the history and the origins of the United States and you know, the grandmother that you should respect. And the foods that went along with the New England kitchen were plain, boring, dull, old foods like succotash. Mix some beans with some corn and eat it. Like pea soup sometimes, cornmeal mush. Things that are easy to serve to a lot of people, things that don't have foreign influences, even though New England basically existed, partly because of foreign influences, because we got money from trading sugar made by slaves by sending dried fish to feed slaves. You know, New England's economy has always been extremely international. And yet there was this vision of the isolated farmhouse in New England, which made people very excited and happy and people were happy to communicate lots of places. Here's another New England kitchen. This is an exhibit at the 1876 Centennial Exposition. You know, all those lovely ladies with their big fat bustles and fancy crinolines, they weren't simple like dear old grandma, you know, they could show how sophisticated they were in comparison to those, those simple New England folk. Um, you find actually um, popular magazines publishing stories where they try to pre present the New England drawl of people like Aunt Hepzibah and Uncle Jeremiah up in their New Hampshire farmstead. And it sounds a lot like the way some people try to um, communicate Southern accents nowadays. Well, I don't know, said Uncle Hepzibah. I'm oh, sorry, Aunt Hepzibah. I think you should come back for dinner to be with the family, that kind of thing. It's uh, kind of interesting to see that New England was basically, maybe not the hillbillies, but something like that. You know, those simpler people that you can admire and also look down on at the same time. While all these exhibits were getting so popular, who was actually living in New England? Well, a lot of people worked in places like this. This is a photo of the American Waltham Watch Factory, as you can see. Um, in 1900, about 70% of people in New England didn't live on quaint antique farmsteads with pewter plates. They lived in the city. 88% um, of the population of Rhode Island, 86% of Massachusetts, 60% of Connecticut lived in urban areas. And that's where most of the people were. Um, a quarter of the people living in New England were foreign born in 1900. We were a region of immigrants and of factories and of cities, not of places where people put bean pots in ovens and left them to stew for hours. You know, these women, they weren't at home cooking. They were working all day. You come home, you throw a chop in your frying pan on, you know, whatever little stove you might happen to have in your cold water tenement, if you have water at all, and you fry it up and that's dinner. It's very much like how working families eat today. You know, you eat what you can get. You buy bread at the bakery. You're not making pumpkin pie. You're not simmering hash for, sorry, mush for hours on end. Why isn't this the representation of New England food? You know, the chops and things that immigrants were eating. Well, 
Here's another reason. We have the nostalgia as expressed through the New England kitchen. Here's another New England kitchen that influenced ideas of what people ate a lot. Well, here she goes. Ah, there she goes. Ellen Swallow Richards, uh, first woman to graduate from MIT in chemistry, a uh, social reformer, a uh, scientist, very much a scientist, did things like tracking water pollution in Massachusetts, eventually turned her attention to public health was very concerned about nutrition among all the immigrants who were living in slums, in tenements, in crowded in Boston's North End, in Lowell, in Springfield, all the places there were factories that were attracting immigrants from Quebec, from Ireland, from all over the place, from Greeks, from Poland, from plenty of other countries. Um, she wanted to make sure people could eat. She wanted to make sure people could eat cheaply. Her idea of improving the life of people living in tenements and working for factory raises wasn't to advocate to get them paid more so they could buy a middle-class diet. It was to find what food they could prepare as cheaply as possible. So they'd have money to buy better housing, better clothing, you know, better things for their children. She actually went to the extent of setting up a New England kitchen in two locations in Boston in the 1890s, one in Jamaica Plain and one in the North End. And she fed people from there. She had to carry out restaurants where she would offer cooking classes, not her, she worked with a variety of other people. Um, and she would also offer up food to take out. And this food was supposed to be cheap economical things that could be bought and sold cheaply and a model for what poor people should eat to get the maximum nutrition for the minimum amount of money. Now, remember at this time, vitamins had not been discovered. Swal Richards and her cohorts knew about fats, they knew about protein, they knew about starches, but vitamin C wasn't really on the menu, vitamin B, nah. Uh, so, you know, she talked about things like vegetables and fruits being sort of charming and, and amusements, but not the center part of a decent, hardworking person's diet and not economical, certainly. They're indulgences, things you bought if you had some extra money, but if you didn't have extra money, you should stick to things like oatmeal and pea soup and boiled hominy. Uh, if you look at the menus of things they took out, it was basically all mush. You know, they, she offered beef broth, pea soup, clam chowder, corn chowder, succotash, creamed codfish, corn mush, boiled hominy, oatmeal mush, cracked wheat, baked beans, and Indian pudding, everybody's favorite. You know, there wasn't anything you could chew in all of her offerings. And in fact, uh, both of her kitchens closed down within a couple of years of starting because they just weren't popular. People wouldn't buy it. Um, there's a quote from, uh, was it an Irish woman who was confronted with this food? Uh, one of Ellen Swallow Richard's disciples asked her, uh, wouldn't you like to take this home with you? It's so nutritious. She said, I'd rather eat what I'd rather, which is the title of a book that I read a little while ago. Um, Ellen Swallow Richards didn't only present this to the hardworking immigrants in the North End and Jamaica Plain, who, by the way, tended to spend their extra spending money on buying better cuts of meat, things they could enjoy there and in the moment. You know, if you're working 12 hours, 14 hours a day in a factory, you come home, you're exhausted, you don't have much money left over, you can't get yourself a better place to live and still get to your factory job. One of the few pleasures you have is buying meat that you could barely ever afford when you were living in the land you came from. Um, and, you know, Richards talks about the difficulty of struggling against that, calling it selfish as opposed to human in some places. Um, she took this kitchen uh, exhibits for it to different exhibitions and fairs. Um, and it was another place where people got to enjoy mush, New England mush as refreshments at the Chicago Exposition. I'm not going to tell you the exact name and the date of where Ellen Swallow Richards exhibited her, her kitchen because I can't remember and I have to talk to you about other things before my time runs out. Um, if you look at the Fannie Farmer cookbook and there's selections of foods featured there, it clearly seems to be influenced by the foods that Richards was promoting in her New England kitchen as being especially healthful and good for people. Um, the 1912 Fannie Farmer cookbook actually features not one, but two recipes for Indian pudding, one of which is mock Indian pudding. If you don't happen to have cornmeal around, you can make something like Indian pudding. When you need Indian pudding, 
by making it out of crackers. So just to recap a little bit, I talked a little bit about the story behind baked beans. Ah, I am flipping back and forth here. About baked beans being had this just so story about the happy Indians meeting the happy pilgrims and having a happy recipe exchange, which is again a story of a lot of stories about New England food that showed up around 1976 in bicentennial cookbooks, you know, which make it seem like early New England was just a scene of happy, you know, togetherness instead of a location of King Philip's war. Um, we talked a little bit about molasses and sugar and how a lot of molasses seems to have come in in the later 19th century. Actually, you can see the evolution not only with baked beans, but also with gingerbread. Um, if you look at recipes for gingerbread starting about 1870, you see uh, the number of recipes and cookbooks which have sugar in them go down and down and down. A number of recipes with molasses increase dramatically. Um, it seemed like that was the only way to make gingerbread authentic or real was to have molasses in it. Whereas if you look at recipes before that, you know, 1800, Amelia Simmons, all them earlier cookbooks, people have sugar sometimes, molasses sometimes. It's not a necessary ingredient until you get to this time when people are looking to the past, looking to the New England of the past and trying to create recipes that represent historic New England as opposed to contemporary New England, which was a place of cities, of immigrants from different lands, of people who didn't cook so much or at least didn't cook long time simmering stews on their stove like baked beans. So there's this image of New England food. There are food lists which are basically seem to be based on seafood and whatever Ellen Swallow Richards was cooking back in the late 19th century, this idea of New England food. But we're here now. We can choose what we think of as being our culture as representing New England, if there is such a thing as representing New England. I mean, when you go from you know, Connecticut up to Madawaska, Maine, you're spanning hundreds of miles, completely different climates. Uh, Boston Globe keeps on listing clam chowder as being part of New England, but was this really a part of the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont until recently? Maybe not. How do we represent New England? What actually represents who we are now as a diverse, as an urban, and as a highly industrialized area? One thing I didn't mention when I was talking about immigrants a few minutes ago is, you know, we now haven't grown a lot of food for people in New England for a really long time. It's come from somewhere else. And a lot of it has been, is processed. A lot of it is food that's been stored for a while. We're not the South where you can just pick a tomato off the vine all the time and have it nine months of the year. We're a place which has always had very industrial food systems. What are, what are we? What do we represent us today? I'm gonna to show you a little clip which shows one proposal for what represents New England. Rhode Island, the ocean state, where our restaurant and fishing industry have been decimated by this pandemic, are lucky to have a governor, Gina Raimondo, whose program lets our fishermen sell their catches directly to the public, and our state app appetizer, calamari, is available in all 50 states. The calamari comeback state of Rhode Island casts one vote for Bernie Sanders and 34 votes for the next president, Joe Biden. Okay. Some of you probably remember this clip from the summer from the roll call for the Democratic Convention. If you didn't, you'll probably remember it now. So Rhode Island, the place of ninja chef calamari makers. Great, calamari sounds like a good thing, represents the strong Italian heritage in Rhode Island and Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, it's squid, squid is easy to catch, it's available at all 50 sites. Sounds like a great way to represent New England. Let's make calamari an official New England food, uh, except there may be a problem with that. Rhode Island. Ah. As this writer observes, calamari, uh, Rhode Island is the calamari comeback state because basically every other fish has been fished out of Rhode Island at this point. Um, you know, the cod fishery has pretty much collapsed in Rhode Island. Um, the Narragansett Bay is getting warmer because of climate change such that um, the lobsters have basically left. And um, this has been true for a lot of different seafood in, in New England. If you look back over the 19th century, you see a series of New England 
uh, seafood booms and crashes over time with things like halibut and haddock and you know this century's cod. Is calamari comeback a really good way to represent our region when it's the result of you know basically overfishing? There aren't other fish out there eating the squid, so there are plenty of squid. Is that how we want to think of ourselves? Maybe that is who we are right now. I'm not sure. You know, another case is the Maine lobster. There it is, driving a car. No, this is a license plate for Maine. And actually, lobster license plate for Maine had been kind of controversial, partly because of what I mentioned a minute ago, that a lot of Maine isn't on the seacoast. Um, a lot of lobster on the seacoast doesn't go to feed people on the seacoast. It goes to tourists on the seacoast. There were comments when a lobster license plate was first proposed for Maine that, oh, we could put the mosquito on there. At least we have that everywhere in the region. Um, why is a lobster a symbol of Maine? Uh, partly because there aren't as many lobsters farther south from Maine right now. You know, there used to be a massive Massachusetts lobster industry in the first half of the 19th century, and they were pretty much fished out uh, to feed people in Boston and New York. It accelerated once people managed to invent um, lobster bounds, boats that could transport lobsters um, basically alive. Um, advent of railroads, the advent of canning made lobsters even more popular and even more fished out. Um, by the way, another fun part of looking through Victorian cookbooks is seeing how many lobster recipes start with open a can of lobster. Um, nobody really wanted to pick through those claws. Everybody relied on the canneries that opened up in Maine after the Civil War and then later the canneries in Canada to supply their lobster habit. So when we have seafood, Again, it's, it's an iffy proposition as representing New England because it has been overfished and because it's not available to a lot of people in New England, it's expensive. You can get lobster rolls at McDonald's in the summer, but would you rather pay you know $10 for a lobster roll or two bucks for a Big Mac? I know what most people would choose. If we want to think of New England food as something that people eat today, as something that people like to eat, unlike most of the molasses-based concoctions, as something that reflects the people who live here in all their diversity, in all their joy, in all their being overworked, two family, um, yeah, both parents working homes, things that are economical, that are cheap enough for people to actually buy and eat on a regular basis, not just at Christmas, not just at Thanksgiving. What actually represents New England food? What, what actually represents our culture as we are today? I have some ideas about this. Okay, next slide. So what stuff you can buy anywhere? Fluff. Fluff was already mentioned. And thank you again, uh, Marshmallow Fluff, pretty universally liked, uh, destroyed the career of one Cambridge, Massachusetts councilman who once suggested that uh, Cambridge public schools not give children marshmallow fluff or nutter sandwiches as the default food when they forgot to bring their lunch a few years ago. Oh, he learned well, the little joys of fluff. Up in the upper left, we have whoopie pies. You can get them at gas stations. Anybody can buy them. They're fairly cheap. They seem to be pretty popular. They come in about 20 different flavors, including things that are kind of repulsive. But this is the classic. This is, you know, the, the sweet cream marshmallow stuff, maybe made with fluff on a soft chocolate bun. It's not a moon pie because it's squishier. Uh, we have fish sticks. Fish sticks were invented in Massachusetts. Thank you, Gordons. Um, they are completely industrial and artificial food. Uh, they had to make a big campaign in the 1950s to get supermarkets to have special freezers to put them in. They lobbied to have them put in school lunches. I bet some of you remember fish sticks from school lunches. They are factory made. Then they're made with fish imported from far away because you can't really find enough cod or whitefish in Gloucester for the Gorton's factory, which is largely staffed by immigrants from Latin American countries at this point. So it seems like a goody, pretty good represented to New England to me. Um, in the lower right is some callaloo, uh, commonly grown by people like the Jamaicans who come to work in New England apple orchards as seasonal workers. Um, I've seen some of these, the uh, apple orchard guys selling callaloo at farmer's markets around the region along with the apples that they grow. Um, upper right, that is roast turkey, but this one is, um, at least the picture claimed it was pavichon turkey, which is made with spices and so on that are typically used to treat pork. 
This is a poor, but applied to Turkey to make it better. Uh, this is a Puerto Rican tradition. Um, the Latin American descended population in New England today is about 871,000 people. It's grown 60% between 1990 and 2000, um, one in 10 New England residents is you know, descended Latino. There are 600,000 Puerto Ricans in Massachusetts and Connecticut alone. Um, this is New England. New England is Latin American food. New England is Puerto Rican food. You can see the tostones down there, the fried plantains next to the turkey. They are at least as valid as some remote farm state in Vermont in 1880 determining what should be on our official list of New England food. Um, and this is what's happening here and now. I don't know that much about current day ethnic community traditions in New England, but I'm pretty sure they're not serving a lot of Boston baked beans. Jenny, by the way, I see in the supermarkets. So we have these opportunities to redefine what New England is in culinary terms, to define ourselves by something other than the mush that Ellen Swallow Richards thought was nutritious or the stuff that somebody thought Aunt Hepzibah made on her homestead in 1800 when they're putting together a fair exhibit in 1870. We don't have to stick to all of the official lists that have come down to us from that were you know, made up in 1976 for a Dicentennial book. We can change this, um, but we have to start thinking about New England in a little bit different way, not as what do we think Yankees ate back on the farm in 1790, but what are people eating in Springfield and Hartford um, in Burlington today? And because this is the Boston Public Library talk, I'm gonna talk for a moment about the name Beantown. So this is bonus, this is beyond the book, but I thought I should look into this a little bit since you know, you guys are hosting me. So I'm gonna go on to the next slide, okay. Why is Boston Beantown and not Beverly or Rennie? I took a few minutes to look at the word Beantown because I knew I was giving this talk and looked at where the other Beantowns are in New England. You know, there's one that comes up a lot in Maryland. Uh, Danbury, Connecticut was called Beantown supposedly because of its crops. If you look in the latter half of the 19th century, there are two cities that come up as being Beantown before Boston gets declared the Beantown a bit later, um, Beverly and Reading, Massachusetts. And um, in 1871 and 1872, both are declared to be called Beantown. And in 1874 and 1889, you find the exact same story about Beantown being told about um, Reading, Massachusetts, and then Beverly, Massachusetts, and Lucy Larcom's classic, A New England Girlhood. And I'm going to tell it to you. Well, here's the shortened version of the story. There was a stagecoach running from the town that was called Beantown to Boston. And the stagecoach was called the Beanpot. Could have been Reading, could have been Beverly. Doesn't matter for the story. This coach stopped one day in Charlestown, which from time immemorial, according to one of my sources, was called Pigtown. Another coach driver came the other way and said, get out of your way with your old Beanpot. Whereupon the coach driver replied, hold on, I'm only waiting to take in my pork. Ha ha ha. I suspect that there were some sort of euphemisms involved. I don't know exactly why, but yeah, beans meant pork. They didn't talk about, I'm only waiting to take in my molasses at the time. So jolly jokes from 19th century Beverly and Reading. Um, there are different explanations as to why Beverly or Reading might have been called Beantown. Basically, Beverly had a factory that made bean pots. Redding, supposedly they took Sabbath very seriously and took their pots of beans to the bakers to bake overnight. And that's why it's called Bean Town. I don't know, these both sound like fake lore to me, but let it be known that there was a bean town before Boston. So how did this get to be part of Boston? I can tell you when. I might not be able to tell you why satisfactorily. So this sticker, this image is probably the reason why Boston was called Beantown. In 1907, their Boston sponsored something called Old Home Week. Throughout New England, starting in about the 1880s and onwards, when people started having more money to travel, when tourism, when visiting other places besides your home became more popular, became a cultural thing. 
many New England towns sponsored old home days or old home weeks. That was supposed to be the time when all the kids and grandkids who had moved off somewhere else were supposed to come back for a week or a day to celebrate the old town folks. You know, those old New England farms again where grandma had sat with the spinning wheel and the butter churn, that kind of thing. They would have parades. They would um, dedicate historical, uh, historical markers. They would have picnics, everything fun you could think of in the 19th century. Boston decided to have one in 1907, and they decided they wanted a lot of people to come, a huge number of people to come. There was a very large 1907 marketing effort around the country, and part of this effort was distribute stickers advertising Old Home Week. Stickers were kind of a big deal at the time. They, they were kind of new. A lot of newspapers at the time, when they published the word sticker, put quotation marks around it. It was a sticker, one of those newfangled paper and glue things. They sent out a million of these stickers all around the nation with a picture of a bean pot and Boston right underneath them. And uh, suddenly, if you look at Google's Ngram viewer to see the mentions of Beantown, it goes way up after 1907, after the Boston Old Home Week. And you see the bean picture showing up again and again in postcards from Boston. I'm going to show you a couple from the Boston Public Library. But again, it's pretty clear that not that many people who lived in the urban areas that were most of New England, in Massachusetts, in Portland, Maine, were cooking with bean pots. I mean, they had stoves. It was an old timey, supposed to be an old fashioned, something that harkened back to the old days even then. It was old fashioned 1907. It was old fashioned probably by 1880, probably by 1850. But this was supposed to be a symbol of Boston, again, harkening back to when New England was important, when you lived here to New England virtues, not to what people actually ate. So here are another couple of pictures from the Boston Public Library Flickr collection, which is a pretty awesome collection, I must say. Greetings from Boston. Welcome back for Old Home Week. Look, there's Lady Liberty or something opening up a bean pot, or I don't know, that should be a lid, but in fact, that is a wheel. So I don't know if they put wheels on top of bean pots. They didn't put wheels on top of bean pots, but there it is right on top of Boston. Boston is a bean pot. After 1907, also um, the phrase, you don't know beans about Boston became very popular. Let's see, here's, here's another bean pot, look. The state house is actually part of a bean pot, which dwarfs your entire table. No one can eat at the table because there's a bean pot covering the whole thing. I love that little, uh, you know, uh, colonial revival bee up there on the flatware as well. Okay, one more postcard. Here you go. You don't know beans until you come to Boston. So again, look, symbols of progress. There's the custom house tower, newly built 1910. I'm gonna get that wrong. Automobiles, triumphant statues, and a big pot of beans, which has a handle, which is interesting. Anyway, so one more picture. You don't know beans until you come to Boston. And look, beans will drown you with this grand miasma of beans. It looks ghostly. It looks like they're having a seance just to raise the spirits from the beans. Or maybe that's the flatulence that will enter their uh, charming Victorian bodies after they eat it. I'm not sure. But you can see why Boston and Beans and Beantown become popular. It was kind of hokey, kind of silly, kind of made people feel like they're old fashioned, like some, there was something unique to Boston. When these beans actually represented something else, when they represented how people wanted Boston to be thought about. So again, if you love these postcards, Boston Public Library has a great collection on Flickr. Just look for Beantown, you'll see a dozen, maybe more things just like this. Um, and while you're doing that, think about if you were to make a list of New England foods or even a Boston foods that you wanted to share with the nation that you thought really represented who lives here and you and your culture and, and what you like, what would be on that list? Where would you find it? Where would people eat it and have it? And who would have it? Uh, who can afford it? Who has the technology to make it? Who has access to a stove or an oven or a hot plate or a slow cooker or an Instapot to make this food? Or is it something that you can pick up at a gas station or a supermarket or a little, you know, a little 24 hour store? Is it something that's accessible to people? Is it something that people will like coming from different cultures? Um, I have more questions than I have answers. 
And as I explore it, you can find me in lots of different places on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram as I try to figure out where we are and where we're going. And that's what I have to say. And I want to apologize for not answering questions during the talk, but I'll go back and look at the chats or maybe Diane, you can help me by asking some questions now. Um, and I want to thank you for your time. I, I love talking about beans, even if I don't actually like eating them very much. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop screen sharing and come on back. So thanks, thanks Meg. Um, we can take any other questions now that if people want. Duncan, yes, very good idea. Pizza. So the problem with a lot of foods that people eat up here is that they eat them a lot of other places. Um, Keith Stapley and Kathleen Fitzgerald are looking at a kind of things from a kind of different view from me. They did a wonderful book. I really respect New England's founding foods, but that's not about what how we should think about New England foods now and who we are now. We're we're sort of working at the problem from kind of different angles. So I respect that, Elizabeth F., but I disagree with you. Let's see. Quebec influences. Beans and mill towns, bean hole beans and lumber camps. What about bean hole beans and lumber camps? There's something that's easy to make with technology you have in a lumber camp, which is means you're stuck in the middle of nowhere with stuff like fires and pits and a stove, and you have to make a lot of food for a lot of people really quickly. Um, are they made by the happy Indians and the pilgrims? Probably not. Um, pouring molasses on food and lumber camp is a great thing to do because people are expending 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 calories a day. That's another great place that we could have gotten the sweetener in. Um, one thing I didn't mention was um, with beans that Sandra Oliver talks about how when beans started to be canned after the Civil War, um, a lot of the makers, the beans weren't baked. They didn't look brown like baked beans were supposed to. So they started adding more and more molasses to give them that brown color. And people enjoyed that taste. So that's another influence in how beans might have become molassesy. Somebody asked, so what is the authentic recipe? Oh, what is authenticity? Um, if you're talking about how people made beans in the first half of the 19th century before this molasses craze started going, um, you can find things in like, you know, Lydia Maria Francis Child's housewife. They have different proportions of salt pork to beans at different times. Um, you know, in the first quarter of the 19th century from the recipes I saw in things like farmer's journals, you started with like a one to four ratio of actually a one to two ratio of salt pork to beans. And over time it went down and got lower and lower and lower. I think as salt pork and meat in general got more expensive in America or fewer people were making beans on a farm where they just had a barrel of pork next to them. Um, but, you know, authentic to whom? Authentic to when? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Quebec influences. I have my suspicions about Quebec and baked beans in New England. Um, you know, there's a tradition of the cabana sucre of, um, you know, maple sugaring going on up there. People poured maple syrup on everything. Um, access to it. I'm sure people put it in their beans too. Um, maybe it's hard to document there. I spent some time looking for documentation of French Canadian foodways in America. Um, you know, 500,000 French Canadians moved to um, New England to stay between 1880 and 1920. A lot of people went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth because why not? You make some money, you go home. Um, and there isn't a lot of documentation of it apart from, you know, social workers going into terribly poor houses in Lowell and documenting how little people had to eat. Um, it's not something that people recorded very much, at least not in English. Um, I haven't found a good, Somebody needs to do a dissertation on this and find recipes and journals from someone I have not located yet. And I'm, I'm sorry that that's the case. Uh, looking, going back up. When the Lowell speak only to Cabots and the Cabots speak only to God. Yes, the land of the bean and the cod. Why is it the land of the bean and the cod? What about B&M in Maine? Yeah, they make a lot of beans. Go B&M. You know, if you think the authentic New England recipe is a can of beans, at this point, you're probably right. Sounds good to me. Um, going back up, that story made no sense. No, it didn't really, did it? <laughs> uh, but it sounds like something your grandpa would tell you, doesn't it? And I think that's why Lucy Larkin put in Old Town Boats. Malden, yes. Nobody in Boston has ever said Bean Town. Yep. Uh, but do you know beans from Boston? Butternut squash soup. 
Are we talking about tourist food of what people eat, have eaten? Also remember New England Maritimes was founded on cod. Yes, it was. And a lot of that cod went to the Caribbean and got exchanged for molasses. Um, tourist food. A lot of New England's tourist food restaurants have actually been closing in the past few years. I don't notice like Durgan Park disappeared. Uh, partly because it was bought by out-of-towners who tried to uh, put things like Coca-Cola pork ribs on the menu. I, I actually saved one of the last few menus, have it. But also because it just, it just doesn't sell. You know, we have not been able to promote this vision of New England food beyond New England. And I think it's because it didn't actually really represent what most people were eating here. Um, yeah, people, somebody about here, test your friend learning about beans from the Indians. Um, no mention of friends baked jeans and their popular jingle. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> I've heard the, I know about friends baked beans and I know about the popular jingle, but um, blame that incentive Miss Wretched for not being essentially woke as we all are today. I don't blame her for not being woke. I blame her for not knowing about vitamins. And I blame her for not seeing poverty for poverty as opposed to something that can be solved through science. And you know, a lot of people think the same way today that the way to deal with poor people is to simply teach them to eat better. Um, you know, make sure that they can't use their SNAP benefits to buy jelly beans, as opposed to, you know, making sure that everybody has enough money to live on. It's a political debate. I happen to be on one side of it, and I make no apologies for it. Which was more expensive at the time, sugar or molasses? Um, so sugar was more expensive before the Civil War, partly because tariffs were put on foreign sugar. Um, it became much, much cheaper after the Civil War. And if you look at sugar consumption data, um, basically Americans have been steadily increasing how much sugar they eat, total sugars in terms of sugar, corn syrup, molasses, ever since the Civil War. It's just gone amazingly high. Um, there's one graph in my book I, I show where somebody predicts America's diet will be entirely sugar by 2200, where they show the natural end of the hideous trend. Um, teeth weren't so good in those days, so mush was preferred as opposed to needing a chew a lot. True, but you know, Ellen Swallow Richards did things like not putting any pork in her pea soup, so it basically had no flavor whatsoever. She didn't like salt all that much either. She just, you know, she thought that. And she was, you know, in line with a lot of health experts at the time that any sort of spicing was bad for your stomach. If you want to look into the question of indigestion in the late 19th century, there's huge conversations about it, about what will make you upset. Um, pie. Pie was blamed for a lot of indigestion among Yankees, too. Um, you know, a lot of the people working North End were young. They didn't need to eat mush. They had perfectly good teeth. Um, a lot of people preferred to use their teeth eating meat eating things like great steaks and cuts of pork, which had the advantage you could cook them quickly when you got home from work instead of having to stand over a stove, which you might not even have access to. You know, some people were living places that didn't really have any kind of heat at all. You know, how could they cook anything? Uh, there's some amusing, um, nasty comments about Polish immigrants to um, the Pioneer Valley um, after about 1910, where they talk about them putting a string around their piece of meat and putting it in the communal pot and then fishing it back out again <laughs> to eat. Um, you know, just how could they do it? Ew, you know, it's touching other people's food, that kind of thing, as opposed to looking at, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if everybody had their own stove and their own pot to cook with? You didn't necessarily. How could you take over the whole stove just to, stove, just to stir your pea soup for an hour when there were 20 other people who wanted to cook something with it? Old New England, a lot to do with the New England. Yes, Millie Ron, you have a lot of questions. Connectivity issues. Tolhouse was in Whitman, yes. Okay. Are NECA wafers considered food? <laughs> I had this debate with friends of mine recently, some of whom complained that NECA wafers are an entirely mineral substance, specifically chalk. Um, NECA wafers, sure. Uh, remember, they weren't manufactured for a little while. They the manufacture. They, they close down briefly. They're back in production again. You can still get them. Um, you know, I'm fingers crossed that they will survive into the future, but sure, great. Pines came before deciduous. You know, they, New England has a lot of different forest types and some of them are mixed pine forest. Um, you know, out in my backyard in the conservation land in my town is uh, mixed pine oak forest. Oaks would have been there before the red maples, before the sugar maples. Beans were native plants. Okay. 
There are beans that are native to Europe and there are beans that are native to North America. When you look at the foods that were adopted by the first English settlers that got here, beans were one of them because they were familiar. There were varieties of kidney beans, basically, if I'm remembering correctly, that were grown in New England by the Wampanoag, along with the corn, which you know had been, was a Mexican plant, basically, which had been bred and adapted to the New England climate. Um, so it was a familiar thing. Um, when you're talking about the foods that the pilgrims are making most of the time to eat, not all the time, you know, people made fancy stuff sometimes too. Um, you're talking about pottage. And pottage is sort of the precursor of what became succotash in one hand and New England boiled dinner on the other hand. You know, what is pottage? You throw beans, if you have them in a pot, you throw grain in the pot, you throw water in your pot, you might throw some vegetables or fresh herbs if you're lucky enough to have meat that goes in the pot too. You let it boil and you stir it and you eat it. It's what's for dinner. It's what's for breakfast. It's what's for lunch if you stop to eat lunch. Um, remember the peas porridge, hot peas porridge, cold peas porridge in the cot, hind, five days old. Some like it hot, some like it cold, some like it in the pot five days old. That's basically about pottage. So this idea of something that you stir up with a bean in it was common in Europe and very easily adopted by the the pilgrims and the Mass Bay Colony folks who settled here and started to grow crops that would actually grow well in New England. Um, so yeah, beans were native. They're also non-native. They're all over the place. Um, interestingly, uh, the pumpkins that people started using over here, um, they were in Europe because they previously had had seeds imported by um, previous explorers, Spanish and Italians who brought them back and uh, grew them and hybridized them in Europe. And there's some very uh, lovely book illuminations from the 16th century, which um, have vines on them showing different squash growing in um, an idealized Italian courtyard. So um, going back, Boston, the Indians don't say Boston baked beans, they just call them baked beans. Yeah, but other people call them, yes, uh, Boston baked beans. So, you know, where did, it's about what is this image we're projecting? and why, and where does it come from, and what can we do about it? Jillian Webster to everyone, if you judge by airport gift shops, then chocolate curd grand cranberries are traditional New England food. Maybe not traditional, but they seem to be New England food now, I guess. I don't really care for them that much, but you know, that's me. Going backwards, Boston cream pie, yes. Parker House rolls. Ah. I apologize for my mistake about Toll House being in Whitman. Ruth Graves Wakefield was the owner. Yes, you are absolutely correct. I apologize for my misspeaking. This is, it comes to thinking about Reading too much when I was preparing for this, this talk and about Reading being Beantown. So Wakefield kind of bled into my brain and I apologize for that. The Wayside Inn has great Indian pudding. Glad to hear it. The Deerfield Inn has the best Indian pudding. Ooh, I see an Indian pudding war going on in the comments. Well, you know, you guys are gonna have to duke it out. Great at Dugan Park. Let us have Sam Adams. Yes. Sam Adams is actually Coke beer. I am not going to comment about beer. Brown bread. Trader Joe's, which is one of the forces for um, anti-food diversity in America, along with Whole Foods, in my opinion. They were selling brown bread for a while, but they labeled it as hobo bread, not brown bread, even though it was the exact same thing and pretty much exactly the same shape. They were selling it in a plastic wrapper, not a can. Very strange. Whole Foods also doesn't sell rye flour, which always bothers me. Necco wafers, Boston cream pie, Big Newton's fluff. Yes, this is being recorded. Hello from Indianapolis. Hello to you too, Indianapolis. Hello from Vancouver. It's being recorded. All right. Scrolling back down in the chat to see butternut squash soup. Maybe that's New England. Maybe it's not. I don't know. What Does it have to be unique to New England to be a New England food? Is this what we're going to serve outsiders? People from outside, from, from beyond, like me, sort of. Okay. Um, scrolling down to the bottom, any more questions? Beans were cheap. Hot dogs and beans. Eat out of the can. Yes. Okay. Civil War soldiers went to the South and baked beans on Saturday night to keep tradition. Um, that may be true, but you also see people um, writing in popular magazines in the 1830s about keeping the New England tradition of baking beans on Saturday nights. Basically, a lot of people who moved out of New England for better opportunities west decided that this was a tradition of New England that they should keep as New Englanders. It was sort of an ethnic thing. Um, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone in New England was doing that. Um, again, particularly people who are living in the cities. And a third of people in New England were living in cities by 1830. We got really urbanized really fast, which is another part of the problem of talking about New England food. Because, you know, when you think about other regions, you're talking largely about um, agrarian traditions or fishing traditions that are, are maintained through today. Except when you're going to Minnesota and you talk about hot dish, which is also completely artificial and made of, you know, canned and processed food. Um, and, you know, in New England, we have this weird mix between talking about foods that we think, you know, the, the colonists should have been eating, which had nothing to do with people eat today. It's this disconnect that that bothers me. Pork and beans is a Western tradition. Pork and beans is a New England tradition. Cornbread was a New England tradition during colonial times for crying out loud. You know, it's what we could eat. Um, Corn, you got three times the yield per acre than for wheat when the colonists forgot, first got here. And yet cornbread is not really a New England thing anymore. Um, but I talk about why that is in my book. Beans native North America, Maine, okay. Field work and research in Lowell, just gonna need to be, be for research that's out there and it's bean centric. Also do that to see others in research too. Colombian exchange, rye flour is hard to find at many grocery stores, only found at a health food store, yes. Um, yes. This is the interesting difference between Wegmans and Market Basket, for example. Market Basket has navy beans, so you can make the uh, canonical New England baked beans, and Wegmans doesn't. It's interesting looking at what's available at different supermarkets and where the chains originated and where their marketing originated and what foods they offer. Um, you can't always get the stuff you need to make what you think ought to be New England traditional food at stores in New England, um, and that's that's another topic about culture and who we are. Um, and I think I've said everything I can say about questions at this point, Diane. So um, I think we can call it a night. So anyone else? Thanks so much, uh, we're, Meg. We're so happy that you were with us tonight to give us this interesting talk. And right. thanks to everyone for being here. And um, I hope you have a good night. You too. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye. Thank you.